Hey, what's going on, people? I hope everyone is having a great day so far. It's Sunday, and I just thought to myself, why not do a random Q&A? So I'll give people a couple minutes to trickle in. And, um, you know, if you happen to see this stream after I post it, then just skip forward a few minutes um, because that's when the conversations usually gain steam. And please excuse me because over the next few minutes, I'll probably be going back and forth to check on my eggs and potatoes, which I just started up on the stove. But yeah, hope everyone is doing well today. Me, myself, um, the plan is to do my taxes well, to finish my taxes um, and maybe hang out at this cafe down the street from where I live for the rest of the evening, editing videos and so on. I don't have a lot of plans today. And yeah, I think it's time for me to go check on that. One moment. I just got it. And hopefully the background noise isn't too much. Um, the settings in OBS reset on me when I did an update. So you might be picking up some background noise that I wish wasn't there. All right, the eggs are good so far. They're good. So yeah, I'll just give it a couple minutes for folks to trickle in because it's dead right now. I don't know, is there anything on my mind, something I wanna talk about uh, before folks are asking questions? Yeah, probably. So since creating this channel, I've noticed some unsettling remarks that have been made in my videos, like in the comment section. Um, yeah, really unsettling remarks in the comment section and in my DMs on Instagram regarding my physical appearance and people's visceral attraction to how I look. And that is just purely unacceptable, right? We can't have that. I would like to be seen and recognized as a full and complex human being. And if you can't manage to do that, and if you can only see me as one particular thing, an object for your fantasies or sexual pleasure, then I don't want you to be a part of this community. So yeah, keep your thoughts and opinions as far as my sexuality is concerned to yourself. Granted, you have the power to do the exact opposite, um, which is what some of you have been doing. Um, and I have the power to block you from the community or ban you rather. So the choice is yours at the end of the day. And with that being said, I'm going to check on my potato, which is in the oven. Yeah, that's going to be like five more minutes. And then with these eggs. seasoning on them. So am I the only one when it comes to seasoning? Like I don't, I mix my seasonings together. So you're not going to catch me um, with like salt and pepper in separate containers because I like to, I like to mix it up. So 
what I'm basically saying is there's one standard seasoning that I use, which consists of multiple ingredients, right? That's what I like to do. So I'll show you. I'll show you right here. So you see how this says, um, how this says garlic pepper. That's not all this is. It's not just garlic pepper. It's garlic, pepper, cilantro, salt, and, you know, also the salt that comes from pretzels. Because I finished a bag of pretzels the other day, but there was so much salt at the bottom. And I figured, well, why not? Why not just throw it in there? Right. And some of y'all might be like, that's gross. But to me, that's just recycling. Really hoping your channel grows. You won't be needing to address these issues on creepy behavior in the future once more. I'm sure I will. And honestly, I see, I see that as my duty because it's important to call out bad behavior when it happens because um, it could be a teachable moment for folks who cannot distinguish between what is appropriate and healthy behavior and those um, and, you know, what is not appro you know, appropriate and healthy behavior. Hold on. I can hear my hands. I hope that makes sense. So yes, it is annoying and it does feel like, it, it feels violating, quite honestly. Um, but I know that someone will find solace in my, um, in my words and someone will be able to relate to them. So that gives me a sense of peace. How old are you? Right. So another thing I guess that would be good to address is like personal questions. Can't answer those. Like deeply personal questions. <laughs> like how old are you? Or where were you born? Just not comfortable answering them at this point in time. Sunday fun day, two questions. What happened to your Twitter page? Also, did you get accepted to a doctoral program? Yes, I can't tell you which program or what school, but I did get accepted to a doctoral program, a few of them actually. So I'm very proud of myself and grateful for um, the people who helped me to get there. Um, and the first question, what happened to your Twitter page? Um, you know, I, I just, I shut it down because I recognize that like Twitter for me is my safe space. That's what I want to be like personal to me. So yeah, I ended up getting rid of my YouTube Twitter account and just uh, not doing that. Because I go to Twitter mostly to see snippets on news and current events and i'd rather not blur the lines between like a fan page to promote my reaction videos and you know a page that's more personal to me thank you thank you um Uncle G says, I appreciate your perspective on social political issues that were on your Twitter page. My response is thank you. However, I know that some of my um, views can be quite like decisive and alienating to some folks. I mean, they shouldn't be because I always try to lean in the direction of like humanity and understanding like the point of view of people who are being oppressed and neglected. But I think the delivery of my views can sometimes come across as crass, um, which is fine. I don't have a problem. Uh, 
Sorry about that, y'all. Nothing's burning, so I don't know why the fire alarm got set off. But yeah, I think the longer I have social media, the more I realize that sometimes it's important to like compartmentalize your identity so as not to blend everything together. Um, because you can start getting confused about like who you are, <laughs> if that makes sense. Oh my God, did I just spit out a piece of egg? If so, that's gross. Um, so I just don't want to get confused about who I am, even though I know who I am. But once you start mixing like your political views with, um, you know, a channel that is designated to focus specifically on music and, uh, you know, pop culture. And then there's like money involved, of course. And it's just too much. It's too much. What's going on, Manny? It's good to see you, man. Long time no see. But yeah. No, things are going well. I'm happy. And as of right now, I'm just preparing to take the next step in my life, um, which is entering that PhD program. Um, very excited for that. Very excited. Very excited. And honestly, I think that's going to enhance the quality of my reaction videos because you know, I'll constantly be learning and receiving new information, both actively and passively, which is hard to do if you're in the workforce and you're not inside of academia, unless you have like a research based job. Um, but, you know, when I was a teacher or, you know, when I was working in the nonprofit sector, I could... It, it was very hard to like study and just like absorb information without a specific purpose, just like, like to observe, to absorb it. Um, because anything I was absorbing was like from a meeting where, you know, I don't know, the supervisor was coming up with like this um, proposal or uh, this plan to, um, you know, like accommodate the needs of students or clients. And so a lot of the information that I was getting was just specific to my sector. But in academia, it's different. You know, I'll be in classes again. I'll be doing research on topics that I really care about in an interdisciplinary way, um, which will expand my mind in a manner that has not you know, it, it just hasn't been that way in a few years. So I'm really excited to get back, you know, into the groove of things, you know, go back to school. Man, I'm chilling. What's up with you? I have a question for you, dude. Okay, ask your question. Okay, my eggs are done. My potato is like four minutes away from being done. I would hope. And I'm just going to exercise patience. I don't get it. I wish I could turn the volume down for y'all. Let me see if I can. Because I know that shit is probably annoying. What is one thing you do sometimes to expose yourself to new thinking? Ooh, good question. Can you be more specific? Mm. 
because I guess it it depends what I want to th- like. It depends where the gap in knowledge is, and like what the subject is about, right? So I try to go to credible and impartial sources when I want to learn about new topics that I'm not familiar with. Right. So for example, um, finances, I did not know about finances in the first half of last year in 2021, but I have a friend who got his master's in accounting. Um, and I was interested in investing. I saved up some money and I was like, I don't know what to do with this money. It's just sitting in my bank account. Um, Is there any advice you can give me? And he's a credible source of information because he has an expertise in um, accounting and finances. So, you know, he gave me the 411 and we sat down and, and talked about ways to invest, what to invest in and what my financial goals are. And I went to him because he's credible and he doesn't really have a vested interest in telling me a lie, <laughs> you know. Um, if anything, he has a vested interest in seeing me succeed. And since he's already proven to me that he himself can succeed because he's doing well for himself, I figured, okay, I want to learn about finances. This is new to me. So I'm going to go to somebody who has that expertise and has proven that he can put himself in a position to succeed and that he understands both on a concrete and on a theoretical level what it takes to you know reach financial success so yeah i just try to look for credible sources um when it comes to things like news i look for whose propaganda is most aligned (laughs) with my like internal beliefs because news is all propaganda at the end of the day. Right. So my thing is like, okay, let me seek out like the most, the propaganda that has like the strongest political, historical and cultural evidence behind it. And align myself with that propaganda, especially if it has a humanitarian bend to it. So I try to stay away from news channels or uh, news publications that are very driven by emotion, like where the anchors have all these opinions. Um, Because like I said, all news is propaganda, but some news is like less propagandistic than others. You know what I'm saying? So I just try to look for that. Like, I don't really want to hear your opinion. I want to hear about what's going on. And then from there, I will figure out what my opinion is. But if you're watching something like Fox News or CNN, you're not going to get like the news. That's not the news or, you know, MSNBC. That's not the news. Those are entertainment channels and a little bit, some of it is like informative, but for the most part, it's just talking heads giving their opinions. And it's like, why would I, why would I want your opinion when I could just pay attention to like what's going on and derive my own opinion? Did you move out? I remember you saying the, yeah, doesn't it look like I moved out? It's a brand new place, man. This place was built last year. Like this whole, this whole structure was built last year. So it's a brand new apartment complex. But yeah, if you're someone who watches the news on TV, I would highly recommend that you don't (laughs) like any news. Don't watch news on TV. Um, 
because it's all supported by like you know billionaire donors and uh, larger media conglomerates who do have strong investments in the things that are happening in the world um, whether it's their ties to like foreign governments or it's their ties to big oil you know and big tech and things like that so try to stay away from the cnn's fox news and also when you're looking at independent media independent news um know that some of those publications are often funded by billionaire donors they just aren't explicit with it you know um but let me check on this potato if you want to know where i go for news um yeah i think this potato is close to being done if you want to know where i go to like follow the news i um i read the new york times sometimes um but for the most part i go to al jazeera because i want to know like like if if i'm watching the news um if, if if i'm listening to or watching the news i want to know like who are they criticizing um what can they get out of criticizing you know that particular uh group and whether they're criticizing people in power or people who do not have power, because those things will tell you a lot. You know what I'm saying? But that goes back to my bias, which is a bias in favor of people who don't have a lot of power. And I've always been that way. Kind of like stand with the underdog. Um, kind of, a, you know, a, approach to the world. So, for example, with everything that's going on with Russia and Ukraine, if I turn on the news and, you know, these anchors are just being critical of the US and the EU and NATO, but they're not drawing attention to any of Russia's historical or geopolitical transgressions, right? Their wrongdoings, then automatically alarm bells are going to go off in my head and I'm going to be like, hold up. Why is this news um, source just criticizing American imperialism and the wrongdoings of NATO in the West, but they don't have anything to say about Russian imperialism. And then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get suspicious. I'm going to get skeptical because it's going to make me think, what is the angle of this particular news organization? And on the other side of the spectrum, if I'm watching a news organization that is criticizing, <clears throat> hold on, let me close one of these windows, that is criticizing Russian imperialism and what their role is in Ukraine, but they don't have a word to say about the racism that's going on as it relates to, you know, the Nigerian refugees, then I'm going to be like, hold up. Something's off here. You know? But the last thing you want to do is not be informed at all because you think everything is a conspiracy. You think you know, there's no value in following the news at all. That's just a lazy way to escape accountability and responsibility because I do think it's our responsibility to be informed. 
especially if you live in the West, like the United States or Europe or Canada, because our country, the countries that we live in play a big role in everything that's going on in the world. So if you're misinformed, then that means you're probably going to look past a lot of human rights abuses that are committed in the name of you know, American freedom or democracy, and that's not right. Yeah, that TV stand is dope. Thank you. Yeah, it's built in. Hey, how do you feel about Bam Bam by Camila? I did a reaction. You should check it out. What are your thoughts on Russia going against its promise to leave civilians alone? Well, I mean, I think in in any large scale war or conflict, saying that you know you're not going to hit civilians or that you'll leave them alone is idealistic and not practical. However, I really don't think that was their intention from the very beginning because. There, there were a lot of reports coming from independent news sources that Russia was hitting civilians and, in fact, targeting them in some instances. So, like I said, I think Russia is um, very propaganda driven. And you could see that right now because they have essentially barred Twitter from operating in their country, along with other um, independent Russian news organizations that disagree with the invasion. In fact, you can't even call it an invasion in Russia or you'll be censored. So at the root of it, um, I think the Russian government, the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin, who runs the entire show, are all dishonest, um, you know, warlords who just care about expanding their uh, imperial presence around the world, not just in Ukraine, because like, if there's anything the Soviet Union taught us, it's that they're not just going to stop once they conquer one country, <laughs> you know, you have Estonia, you have Georgia and you have Poland, which to my knowledge have all at one time or another fallen under the Soviet Union's um, auspices. And so I think Putin's goal is to like remake the the soviet empire and bring it back to its glory days in fact that's what he's expressed in many of his speeches already you know do you think it's okay to become distracted or obsessed with your thoughts of the future um I don't necessarily think it's okay to be distracted or obsessed with your thoughts of the future. I think it's okay to let those thoughts inspire you and to plan um, and to have a plan for how you're going to execute on those thoughts because we live in an action based world. Like it's great if you have the skill to like, like think and plan through things, but ultimately there has to be some form of execution, right? Otherwise it's going to be paralysis by analysis. You're not going to get anything done. And in this world, if you want to be successful, you got to get shit done. So obsessing over thoughts 
doesn't really get shit done. Unless there's a plan of action. Have you seen any interesting documentaries? No, but I want to get back into them. I think I get Netflix for free here, but I can't manage to find the remote. Oh, here it goes. The remote for this TV. But if you have any Netflix recommendations on documentaries, um, yeah, put them in the chat and I'll check them out. But it's been a very long time since I watched TV or even Netflix. Did you ever write in a journal? Mm. Mm -mm. People have been telling me for years to do that, though, like mentors. And I'm sure it's helpful for many people. Don't know if this is true, but different sources point to Russia possibly going from Moldova after, which is right next to Ukraine and was also controlled by Russia in the past. I'm curious to know if Moldova is part of the UN, like it is part of NATO, because if they are, chances are Russia won't do that because it would risk. Um getting into a broader conflict with NATO powers, which is something that none of us should be um, advocating for, you know, a war between Russia and NATO, because that might be the last war ever fought. Mm. Okay, so they are not part of NATO. But yeah, I just, I like to be morally consistent across the board. So I'm against imperialism when it's done by the American empire. And I'm against it when it's done by the Russian empire. It's that simple. But we live in such a politically polarizing climate that people feel the need to like choose sides. Like it's one side or the other. So it's either you're against Russian imperialism or American imperialism. They're like, no, no, I'm against countries invading other countries for the sake of expanding their borders and creating, you know, hegemonic empires that threaten the sovereignty of you know, other nations. It's pretty fucking simple to me, but what's been very disappointing is that a lot of folks on the left, which is where I lean, can't seem to like, can't seem to fathom that the U.S. is not the only you know, hegemonic empire in the world. And that we're not the only country that perpetrates war crimes and vicious forms of colonialism. Fascinating. Oh, hold on. Well, Netflix, but there's one on Hulu called Dropout about a 19 year old girl who invented a device that can detect cancer and other sicknesses through a prick of a finger. Wow, that's fascinating. 
instead of vials of blood. Only to find out it was all a lie and she duped millions of investors. Is this, um, you said a girl, is it a girl or a woman? Cause there's a difference. Are you talking about Elizabeth? What's her name? Elizabeth Holmes. I think that that's her name. Elizabeth Holmes. Yeah, that's a sad story because I don't, I don't think she started out as an inherently like dishonest person with bad intentions, but I think she did get ahead of herself and she was so wrapped up in this savior complex and the lies just started snowballing to the point where you know, she had already gotten these billionaires to invest in that Fugazi plan um, that was, you know, debunked. And she was just like, yo, there's no turning back now. Let's go full force. And yeah, it's a really sad situation because you start giving people false hopes and yeah, not good. I think she's in prison now for like fraud. Rightfully so. Only to find out it was all a lie and she was duped by millions of investors like Walgreens, even tested on cancer patients. I feel like, yo, if one of y'all want to donate a few dollars to this chat, that would be nice because I feel like the content we're talking about is probably going to get my ad revenue limited because it always does on these damn live streams. I don't know how people still do political commentary. I really don't. And like make a living off of that. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, wow. Uh, da, da, da. They're not part of NATO, but it's very likely that Romania, which is part of NATO, will also be involved. Fascinating stuff, but considering she developed sociopathic behavior. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a sad situation. And I know some people might be like, sad. What are you talking about sad? Like, She's a sociopath. It's like, mm, that's why it's important to use those words that you use, like develop sociopathic behavior, because I'm not really big on labels. And I do think that we all have um, problematic tendencies that, you know, exist in like intervals. You see what I'm saying? Um, so for example, when I got into the nonprofit field and started working with people who were experiencing homelessness, drug addiction, and years of being incarcerated in jail. Um, in order for me to do my job adequately, in order to provide the services that they needed, I had to I, I had to emotionally detach from the task at hand, because if I didn't, I would be distraught and I wouldn't be able to function normally. You know, I'd be, when, I, when I'm doing intakes, I would be crying every time I saw a story about, um, every time I was going through a client's history about how they were assaulted or abused when they were kids or about how um, they spent 20 years in prison for, you know, a, a minor drug transaction where they were selling like 10 pounds of weed and, you know, they got a lot. See what I'm saying? So I think like the demonization of certain like mental illnesses is a real problem that um, society needs to address because, you know, nowadays everybody is a uh, licensed psychologist, <laughs> licensed from the University of Know Nothing. Glad to hear you mention your personal finances. I continue to be amazed at how many people I come in contact with that don't know much or don't care about personal finances. Yeah, I mean, 
it's not, especially in minority communities, like black and brown communities, it's not, we just don't have access to that kind of information, which is extremely valuable. So a lot of us turn to like quick money-making schemes because we're in dire need of financial assistance. And so we believe what these rich people tell us when they tell us to invest in crypto, to invest in NFTs, because it's going to make you rich. And since a lot of us don't have financial literacy skills, we just believe it because we see these social media influencers who live in these nice houses telling us you could get rich off of, you know, apes. <laughs> you could get rich off of Ethereum. And we're like, damn, they're probably right. And I want to be just like them. And I trust them. So let me invest in crypto or let me invest in NFTs. And then you find out it's a pump and dump. It's a pyramid scheme, multi-level marketing, you know, that eventually that shit is going to crash the economy. Um, it's a wild, wild west. It's a wild, wild west. It really is. No regulations, no people getting scammed left and right off of it. I'm like, man, I'm cool. I'm going to invest in the S&P 500, which has shown over the course of 100 years that it's going to continue to grow because it is based on the performance of the top 500 companies in the country. So if Facebook falls under tomorrow, or I guess the people who own Facebook, Meta, if Meta falls under tomorrow, that's fine because since I'm invested in the S&P 500, I'm also invested in Amazon. I'm invested in Netflix. I'm invested in, you know, Walmart. But if crypto, you know, if, if you invest in, in a, a crypto or a blockchain or an NFT and that goes to shit tomorrow, and we know it will because cryptocurrency is so volatile, like you, you're not going to have anything to balance you out. You see what I'm saying? So investing in crypto is a lot like gambling. And I don't know about you, but I don't like to gamble with my money. I don't have enough money to gamble. And if I am going to gamble, I'm going to gamble based on a hundred years of information that says the S and P 500 and, and, you know, ETFs and index funds are the most reliable, the most viable, the most stable investments to make. Speaking of crypto, I had a friend joke, like, it's like, an MLM for straight men. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Or Mary Kay for straight men to be more specific. Yeah. So true about people of color. I will continue to have conversations and share info with family and friends and others, whether they're getting tired of hearing it or not. Yeah, man. I mean, I'm someone who doesn't like to give unsolicited advice because I get the sense that when that if someone doesn't ask for it or they don't give a hint that, you know, they're interested in learning more about something, they already think they know the answers. And if I'm speaking with somebody who already thinks they know all the answers, I'm not interested in wasting my breath on them because chances are. I might push them further into, um, you know, their presupposition, what they already think about the world. And if I think they're wrong, I don't want to do that because you might not get them people back. However, I do think it's really smart to um, have those conversations like as like sidebars, you know what I'm saying? not necessarily teaching them anything, but just saying, yeah. And, and, you know, um, you know, I just invested in this, I invested in that and it's looking pretty good right now. It's looking pretty good. Um, and you know, I'm not worried about it because the thing about crypto is like, if you, if you get invested in that, you got to watch it, you got to worry about it. But if you invest in, 
the things that I mentioned, you you don't really have to worry about it. You don't have to watch it. Like the market is just going to do what it does. And chances are you'll be all right, especially if you start investing early. So, yeah. And I've talked with my brothers about it, too. And there are ways that you could have these conversations with people. And you probably know this, but I've talked with my brothers before. I'm like, yo, if you if you want a pair of headphones, bro, tell me you tell me you want a pair of headphones. It's not I'm not rich by any means. But these are things that I get a tax deduction for, you know, I get tax tax breaks for that. And just them hearing that alone, they're going to be like, well, what does that mean? What's a tax break? What's a tax deduction? That means that if you want a pair of headphones and I get you a pair of headphones, I'm going to put that on my um, tax form for YouTube and the government is going to give me that money back because those headphones went towards the business in some way. You see what I'm saying? And since I'm a YouTuber and my channel is monetized, I'm running a business, a small business. And then my brothers have that information forever. They know like, oh, wow, I didn't know that you could get money back. If you See what I'm saying? Um, oh, that's a great question, man. Um, hold on. Fol folklore Evermore. Let me read a couple more first, uh, City Kid. OMG, I love your channel. I'm a Swifty from Saudi Arabia. Much love to you. Much love to you as well. Folklore or Evermore. I haven't heard Evermore yet, but that's on my to-do list. I, I enjoyed Folklore, though. Cardigan was nice. Um, Betty is another song I enjoyed. Uh, August as well. Uh, that's true. My position. They don't know what they don't know. Yeah. And that's how, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Cause you never, if you have access to certain information that might be helpful, but it's foreign to a lot of people, you never want to come across like you're speaking over them. You see what I'm saying? So that's why when I have conversations about finances or politics with people who are not necessarily in that world or super familiar, I like to know what they think. What what do you think? What do you believe? Because based on the information that you share with me, I might be able to um, guide you down a certain path that will, you know, maybe challenge your beliefs in, in some ways, but ultimately get you to where I think you want to be. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And even that is like shaky ground because you're like, well, who are you to know that, to think that you know what's best for you? That's why I don't, you know, I, I try to be humble when, when I give people advice and stuff. I just tell them the shit that's worked for me and the shit that hasn't worked for me, the shit that works for most people and the shit that does not work for most people. And I say, whatever you want to do, do that. My most memorable experience as a teacher, I've had so many, so many, so many. I don't know if I can give one without going into too much detail, though. Let me think. Well, it's always nice when you just have students that are explicit about the impact you're having on their life and who understand the magnitude of what you're trying to accomplish in terms of providing them with a holistic education, not just an education. Because when you come through my classroom, um, I wanna know that I'm providing you with the skills to grow emotionally, intellectually, you know, and, and socially. I don't want it to just be a purely intellectual experience. I put a lot of thought into my teaching, you know. Let me, but that doesn't answer your question. Ooh, tears. Okay, so I, it's not necessary. I might come across as a sociopath, but it's not necessarily that I like to see students cry. But when my words during the lecture evoke strong emotions from them because they are relating to the material on such a deep 
and visceral level, um, that does bring me a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction because I know that they're transforming into something special. I already see them as that, but when you see the transformation take place right before your eyes, it's, you know, you get this feeling of euphoria. You're like, ah, that's why I do it. It's worth it. Um, and when I was working at the nonprofit with these people who, you know, most of them were homeless, um, and they would bring me gifts sometimes. And, and I really had to learn how to like accept gifts and accept people's gratitude because initially I would be very wary um, to cross those professional boundaries in terms of accepting gifts from students. But what I later realized is that's their way of showing appreciation. That's their way of showing their respect for you. You know what I'm saying? And because a lot of people, some people can't necessarily communicate how much you mean to them. But I had a student one time buy me a toothbrush. You know, we had a little sidebar in class. I don't, I don't know what it was because I go in different directions when I'm teaching. But I was like, yeah, I, I got to get, um, I was talking about toothbrushes and they were like, uh, I can't say my name, but they were like, Manny, you got to get, um, you got to get the, the mechanized toothbrush. And I was like, man, that shit, I can't afford no mechanized. And then my student, lo and behold, the next, the next day they bring me a toothbrush, like one of these nice, um, you know, auto automated toothbrushes or whatever you call them. And that shit made me feel so good because I was like, damn, this person is re they are caught out, um, struggling, and they use the little bit of money they had to go out and get me something that I said I needed but couldn't afford. So what, what would I look like rejecting that gift? It would make me look condescending, you know? It would make me look like I'm not appreciative for their care and for their thought. It would make me look like I'm trying to place myself above them based on what I have and what they do not have. And so those are always kind gestures because I know that, you know, beneath the gift itself is sentimental value that they cannot necessarily express the words. And as someone who has had issues with communication myself, you know, I couldn't speak until I couldn't speak in full sentences until I was like five years old. I needed to use a speech therapist. So when I see other people who are, um, you know, going, who are, you know, going through their journey and their gratitude is so immense that they can't even put into words what I mean to them. And so to account for that inability, they go out and buy me something or write me a letter or draw me a picture like that shit is dope. And there are so many other moments, man, so many others. And I haven't had a long teaching history either, but man, so many, so many fun, you know, teaching moments. Um, uh, and it always comes when we're, I don't know, it, it always comes when we're talking about concrete things like difficult conversations and I'm incorporating that into the material or positive thinking versus negative thinking or making references to, um, you know, trauma and the ways in which it affects us as adults. And these things, when, when these discussions arise um, or the link between 
um, deprivation, material deprivation and shame or guilt and embarrassment for, you know, being in the position that we're in. When these topics come up, uh, those, those are some of my favorite ones because that's where the growth happens. You know, it's painful and it's uncomfortable while we're talking about it. Um, and it's also empowering and it gives them the ability to like really internalize the fact that they're human beings. And just because they're in a messed up predicament financially doesn't necessarily mean there's no light at the end of the tunnel. It doesn't make them any less human. In fact, it makes them more human, right? Because they're in touch with levels of despair sadness and distress that most people don't have to face and overcome. So seeing them reach that realization it just fills me with with pride and joy to know that I'm doing what I what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm doing my job. And then also the excitement, the, exc you know, virtual teaching was hard, especially because I wasn't, again, without going into too much detail, I wasn't teaching like adult adults. I was teaching like real, real young adults. So I guess 18, 19 years old, um, this is 17, 18, 19. Like that was tough because, um, one, I came in the middle of the year, the middle of the school year. So, and everything was online. So that was the first time I got like pushback from students. Like I felt like there was a certain degree of respect that just wasn't there. Um, and it was hard to like navigate that because I'm someone who, when you walk through my classroom, it's not gonna be, you don't get the vibe that you could just like violate boundaries and disrespect people. Like you, I'm not gonna give off that vibe. Um, but when it's done like online and you're and you come in the middle of the year to teach like teenagers like they there's just a certain degree of like i don't know like pompousness that some of them have that you know it just makes it hard to navigate but eventually uh you know they they ended up being cool too i just had a couple situations where you know folks tried to like troll in the class um you know, like in the in the chat um and i got like a couple like kind of passive aggressive emails from students and that's something again i had never experienced to that degree before and i just didn't feel like i had the support of staff which makes it worse because if you are working on a staff where like teachers are not holding students accountable in a loving and caring way but nevertheless, holding them accountable, it's going to make you feel alone and alienated as, as a teacher, um, which is why the, the previous job, I always, felt, I always felt like I was being held down, like my, my colleagues were holding me down. Um, because, you know, this is um, a term that is frequently used in the field of social work which is to say sometimes you have clients or students or patients that will try to staff split. So split the opinions of different staff members and manipulate them in you know, individual conversations. Uh, and if they're able to do that successfully, it could make one staff member look at another staff member as if they're the problem, as opposed to like, you know, all of your colleagues, you know, having open lines of communication and being able to identify like, oh no, like we aren't the problem. It's actually like this particular client or student or patient is going through a lot of shit and they're trying to get their needs met. And one of the ways in which they get their needs met is through manipulation. So we got to come up with a game plan on how to address this person's needs without letting them split our staff. See what I'm saying? But in my last job, I just felt like um, 
they did not have that degree of awareness. So if I did have a problem with a student, there was like this un there was this unreasonable pressure and expectation um, for me to like solve the problem with them without taking into consideration that that student might be engaging in like manipulative behaviors and tactics again to get their needs met. Um, so I'm not necessarily placing negative judgment on them, but it, it's just nice to have like a staff that, you know, you are just strong and you're like, yo, the mission is to help our clients. And the only way we could do that is if we are in lockstep with one another and we are handing handling every situation individually, you know what I'm saying? With individual care, with specific care, and we're not applying broad approaches or broad brushes to every situation. All right. So I had one student in my class who um, I told him to turn his camera on. And this is not something I wouldn't, I wanted to do either. That was because the the school was having me um, enforce that rule. I was like, hey, bro, you got to turn your camera on. And at this point, I already made it clear to the class that, look, I don't I don't want to enforce this rule. I don't. But they they want me to enforce this rule. So, you know, we, we do have people who come in. You know, a couple of times people came into my class and kind of sabotaged it and they added pornographic in images which you never know what that can do to the psyche of somebody in your class. So I felt violated and I felt disrespected because I was like, yo, this is my class. These are my students. So why are you like, why, why would somebody come and try to sabotage this class by adding those images? You know what I'm saying? Like in the middle of my class, like if you want to do that and I wouldn't recommend you do that, but if you want to do that, go do it in physics or in chemistry, but we talking about real shit in this class. So don't do that. And you know that you wouldn't have that same type of energy if we was in person, you know? And I told him that too. I was like, um, I, I don't know who it was and we weren't able to figure it out. Um, but no, people know, bro. And I'm not trying to say I'm tough or anything, but there's just certain shit I'm not, if you're around me, you're just not gonna do certain shit because like, I don't give off the vibe that I'm just going to let you do certain shit without embarrassing you. And most people don't want to be embarrassed. So I told him, like, y'all better keep that same energy. when we If we come back to the school, keep that same energy. Keep that same energy. I want to see if you doing playing the little games y'all playing online in the classroom. And then all of a sudden, I get to the classroom for the last, last two months. And I don't hear a peep. I don't hear a peep from any of these people. You know what I'm saying? So I thought that was interesting, but that just goes to show how like troll culture is truly out of control because people ain't, people ain't like in real life, you won't hear a peep from them. And I think that's cowardly shit personally, because I know when I was in high school, I was the exact opposite. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm gonna keep that same energy hundred percent of the time. I can't turn it off. I'm not selective about it. So if I want to troll, I'm going to troll right now, which you like, but a lot of the kids nowadays, they're not, they're not cut like that, you know? They're not cut like that. Anyways, um, yeah, dude was like, yeah, I'm not turning on my camera. And I was like, all right. And then I just booted him from the class because that was those were the directions we were given. So I bring it up to my supervisor. I'm like, yo, I had to do this um, because he was like, he was basically telling me like, fuck off. You might be the teacher, but fuck off. I'm not turning on my camera because I don't want to. And, you know, and he was always giving teachers grief and shit, but I'm not one of them people. So I'm like, OK. And, boom. and she was like, well, you know, you got to work with him. And um, he and he just wants to know that you care. And I'm like, first of all, you're a white woman who's teaching. So don't don't try to come in here like Sandra Bullock. You know, don't try to come in here like. What was that movie with the white woman teacher who came and taught the students of color and thought she knew everything that was going on in their minds and everything that they needed and they wanted? Anyway, um, I was like, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not going to exert emotional labor or try to connect with somebody. One, I don't know him. I, I've never taught him in person. Two, I've reached out to him via email. Um, 
you know, just checking up on him and seeing like, yo, what's up? And like, are, are you good? And, you know, just checking up on him, doing what I'm supposed to do. And um, she was like, no, you got to do more than that. You know, I've showed up to kids' houses and stuff. And I'm like, yo, see, you violating boundaries. And that's what, that's the thing about white women. Y'all have this tendency to like, think you could save everybody. And that's your mission. Instead of being an educator, instead of being a caring, considerate and compassionate educator, you place your wants and your needs and your desires over the people you're supposed to be serving. And so you end up actually becoming a patronizing and condescending force in the fight for good, which means that you're not really fighting for good. See what I'm saying? So I don't want you to try to tell me what I should, how I should be interacting with one of my students who is also a young man of color because there are certain, there are certain codes between men of color. And if I do that lovey-dovey, like, oh, are you okay? And uh, like that shit is going to turn him off. Like he's not going to, he's not going to respond to that. So you, you see there's di certain dynamics here that you're not understanding, but because you're a white woman and because a lot of white women think they know it all, especially middle-class, highly educated white women think they know it all. Suburban white women think they know it all, which is why they voted for Trump because they thought they knew it all. Now you're going to, you might put me in a position to fuck up any potential relationship I could create with this kid. Because you're essentially trying to force me into developing like a mentor mentee relationship with him. Yo, I got 89 other students that I'm trying to take care of. You know what I'm saying? In the classroom. Well, I'm trying to make sure they're right and they're not causing me issues. So you want me to spend a disproportionate amount of time trying to appease and pander to one kid that's giving me problems? Nah, I don't, I don't dislike the kid, but you're just not going to get me to do emotion. I got brothers. I got little brothers. So you're not going to get me to do like un, un, undo emotional labor that you're not paying me for. You see what I'm saying? You're a teacher. That's really cool. Also, first time making it to a live. So hello. Hey, Gianni. Shout out to Canada. During teaching virtually, did you ever have to present or teach through some unconventional or innovative means? I'm sure I have. Did you react to you don't even know me by Fausia? Uh, yes. What subject do you teach? I can't divulge too much personal information. I can only give y'all like broad strokes. Yeah, the one with Hillary Swank, Freedom Riders, yeah. Nobody likes a know-it-all white woman. Nobody likes a white woman who thinks she knows it all. I'm here way longer than I thought I would be, but I'll probably, I'll dip at like, I'll dip in like 30 minutes. Do y'all have any other questions? I think this was a good talk though. And what I love, especially about these lives, though, is that when I do them, like, at least I get like 10 people that unsubscribe as they like, oh, we didn't know we didn't know you was this real. We didn't know. This also reminds me of the company that Issa Rae had in Insecure, wherein she was the only black woman in a non-white in a white nonprofit. And that's what a lot of nonprofits usually are, I guess, dependent. But a, a lot of them are just like fucking hubs for white women, white woman guilt and trauma and insecurity. A white nonprofit that deals primarily with students of color in public schools. 
I'll tell you what, I'm I'm not gonna do that again. Yeah. Working at uh any kind of high school capacity or like with high school students or Because the bureaucracy is just too strong, man. The bureau, and that's why a lot of these kids come out of high school and they can't think critically. They can't even think critically about social justice, which is something they seemingly obsess over. Like, how are y'all not taught to think critically about social justice? And that's all y'all talk about. Because a lot of people that's teaching these kids how to think are white women. And they don't have a strong grasp on intersectionality or power dynamics or boundaries. They just know how to virtue signal. And then some people eat it up. I don't eat it up. Jesus, somebody sent me $50? Um, yo, shout out, shout out to you. I don't want to say your name because I don't know if that would be appropriate. I don't know if you want me to do that, but, um, wow. Thank you. Wow. Like that's a big deal, bro. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, now, that's how I feel about public schools, you know, and, there, and there's no structure, there's no consistency, there, there's no stability. That's why you have all these teachers leaving after teaching for a year or two years, the, the high turnover rates, because it just ain't worth it, man. It's not worth it. I'm not saying the students aren't worth it. I'm not saying they're not worth it. I'm saying the bureaucratic hurdles that you have to jump through in order to do any amount of substantive good it ain't worth it man I'll, I'll just go find another profession i'll go work in another industry where i can achieve the same thing or i'll create this platform where i don't have to you don't set the standards for what i can communicate to my audience and you don't have and you're not going to put me in a in a compromising moral dilemma to convey a message that I don't fundamentally agree with and that I am fundamentally opposed to. See what I'm saying? Like, these schools. That's why when, when I think about teachers who complain about how administration treat them and how it has negative effects on, you know, their their students. I'm like, yo, get out of that profession, go, go, because that's the only way you're gonna convince administration into changing when they realize they have an underwhelming supply of labor and that they cannot continue to run their organization. Only then will they change. But so long as you take part in that enterprise, you're an accomplice. So no, I'm not gonna feel bad for you because teachers don't get paid a lot. I'm not gonna feel bad for you because you teach in a right to work state. I will feel bad for you to the extent that you can complain about it, try to change the system, and if you can't find something else, only then will, or at least make plans to find something else. Only then will I respect your struggle and what you're going through. Otherwise, I don't want to hear shit. I don't, grievance politics across the spectrum is something I just can't get down with. If you see something that's wrong, if you see you know, uh, something uh, in in evil or you know some sort of travesty being committed, you speak up about it, and you keep speaking up about it until 
either you solve the problem or you move on. That's why I had to get out of there, man. I couldn't keep teaching. Couldn't keep doing it. Not at that level. Not, not, at, not in that organization. Because people just weren't appreciative. And then I would say something and there's such a culty behavior. That's why I don't like working in large groups of people either, man. It takes away from, it, it has the potential to take away from your individuality and your ability to think critically because you feel this overwhelming pressure coming from the top down that starts to influence the way you move, you know, and what your goals and aspirations are. And I just, I can't handle that emotional pressure. I can't, I can't because no. Because it can be soul crushing. And I'm sure, you know, school school teachers aren't the only ones who deal with this. Like people who work in corporate jobs, people who work um, at corporations, I'm sure they deal with this all the time too. Like, yo, everybody is doing the same thing. And we all know that what we're doing is wrong or that it's not helping the situation or that it's not efficient or that we are placing other people at a disadvantage by carrying out these tasks and yet we're expected to do it anyway without going against the grain or presenting any sort of opposition i can't do that man i can't do that and then if you do express opposition you go from being like the golden child to the evil villain and it's like yo what what did you think as someone who works in a corporate job that deals primarily with public education i concur yeah you see what i'm what i'm saying i don't like that shit man all that group think yo leave it for somebody else that's why i've never been popular I ne well, that's a lie. I've, I've been popular, but like for the wrong reasons, because some people see me as like charismatic, someone who has strong convictions and um, someone who actually cares about like what he's doing or what he's trying to do, knowing that my intentions aren't necessarily self selfless, but I try to make sure that they're not centered on myself either. So I think that combination of traits has made me popular in many settings. But when people realize that I'm not going to apply those traits to just back up and reinforce everything they want to be done you know what i'm saying if there's any kind of dissent then automatic then, then all of a sudden those are bad treats to have it's like okay that's why i can't do political affiliations either because i don't get along with communist i don't yeah i don't i'll say it. i don't get along with communists i don't get along with capitalists i don't get along with liberals damn sure don't get along with them i don't get along with neocons i don't get along with any of these groups yo any of these groups so you're not gonna have me going along to get along my thing is like who are the people with the least amount of power in what ways are they being taken advantage of and oppressed and what can we do as a collective whole to make sure that we put an end to their suffering immediately? And if not put an end to it immediately, create an immediate plan that will, over time, reduce their suffering. That's what I'm worried about. That's what I'm concerned with.
So I don't care about, oh, Biden, I love Biden, I love Kamala. And if you don't love Biden and Kamala, then we don't we don't mess with you because it's a it's a what what is it, the K hive? The K hive over here. And then you have all these boomers putting out these memes about politics. And y'all, I'm like, all right, see, no, we're not. No, you thought wrong. If you thought I was on your side, you thought wrong because you're treating politics like cosplay. That's why when I see the little um, arm and hammer or whatever you call it from the communists that they'd be putting, everybody wants to be a communist now. All of a sudden, like, that's the cool thing to do. When I was, when I was advocating for communist principles during undergrad and when I was doing activism um, around the campus and as it relates to, you know, graduate um, as it relates to student unions and shit like that, trying to get that off the ground, you know, that was not the thing to do. That wasn't the cool thing. But all of a sudden, something becomes a trend and people cling on to it. See what I'm saying? That's because we don't have enough trendsetters in this society. We don't have enough trendsetters. We have people that want to go along to get along. We, we have people who see the aesthetic of communism and they're like, oh my God, that is so glorious. Like, oh my God, let's fetishize war. Let's fetishize class warfare. War is so glorious. Or And we have people who fetishize capitalism too. Look at this pop culture landscape that we're in right now, where people literally worship these celebrities. They got them in their profile pictures. Yo, if you're over the age of 18, if you're 18 and older and you are indulging in celebrity worship culture yo that shit is that's all bro i'm not a part of that either and so people come in my comments and they say things about these celebrities like you need to react to this we so you could support this artist and i'm like yo just because i'm doing a reaction to these people don't mean that you know i'm deeply emotionally invested in who they are i love and appreciate their work but i don't know them i don't know drake i don't know that man and I don't owe him anything. I don't owe him support. I don't owe him a view or a reaction. I don't know Taylor Swift. I don't know her. I don't know BTS. And I don't want to, I don't care if they just, if this person just got a tattoo or this person just got plastic surgery. I don't care, bro. These people just broke up. I don't care about that. Hey, what's going on, Call Pick Up? I think this is a live stream that you'll really enjoy. So if um if I were you, Call Pick Up, when you get a minute, uh, you know, I'd I'd rewind this and start it from the beginning because I, I think this is at least one of the more fun live streams that I've done. All right, that's why I never went into the teaching profession, especially in the public school setting. I saw and it smelled the bureaucratic bullshit many years ago. True, true. But you know, bureaucracy is just something you're not going to escape unless you start your own shit, which is very difficult to do. And for most of us, it, it takes time and resources, which might require you to engage in bureaucratic behavior. Um, it, you know, it just comes with the territory, but it's just a matter of setting your limits, setting your boundaries, um, and knowing yourself well enough to know that this is, in, this is behavior that I will engage in so long as I truly believe the ends justify the means. And this is behavior that I will not engage in any, um, under any other, under any conditions. And if I do have to make moral compromises, there's there's going to be hell to pay for whoever is forcing me to make those compromises, right? So for example, in my last job, and this is why at this stage in my life, I'm probably unhirable. <laughs> no, I'm playing. Um, but in my last job, I was being forced into so many ethical dilemmas that I started becoming bitter. And I was like, okay, so if you're going to have me do this, um, I'm just not going to show up to meetings on time. How about that? You care so much about me doing this? Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. You want me to do this task? Okay. I'm not showing up to meetings on time. 
And of course, you don't say these things, right? If you want to come up with ways to like interrupt systems, um, you, you got to try to fly under the radar a little bit and engage in Machiavellian behavior, to be quite honest. Um, and so, yeah, there were deadlines I would miss purposefully. Um, I would actually commit to missing those deadlines because I didn't believe in the work. I didn't believe in it. And y'all, y'all forcing me to do these hundreds of other tasks over here, not hundreds, but dozens of other tasks. That's not even in my job description. And you want me to do this too? Uh-uh. And you're not willing to compromise over any of this shit. Okay. So I'll do this. We're going to, you create your list of priorities that you want to be fulfilled. And I'll create my list of shit that I'm not going to do for you because they're lower on the list of priorities for you. And also they're lower on the list of priorities for me. So if you want me to make phone calls to 80 parents and you want me to do it within 48 hours, then here's what we're going to do. To make up for that time I lost, I'm not showing up to any of these meetings on time. I'm going to miss a few of these meetings and lie to you and say, well, it's because the train broke down on the way or something like that, or I'm in traffic or see what I'm saying? When when you want to, when you ask me if I can do something, no, I can't really do that. Or I'll see. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you want me to do this? Well, shit. You don't pay me enough to be professional. And you're not, you're not treating me like a professional. You're treating me like a serf. So that's my advice. If if you want to disrupt capitalism in your own day-to-day life, find a way to get the most that you know and it, Well, let me preface that with something, because I don't want you all to just go start being like um, start manipulating your employees just to do it. And um, if you're unhappy at your job and you feel like your employer is inflexible and requiring an unreasonable amount of output from you, which is tied to things that you disagree with, like on a deeply moral level and you express that to them because this is all about communication too right so you got to communicate to your employers that hey um i noticed that we're doing this i was just wondering like what's a thought process that goes behind or that goes behind like designating this task to me and like what what do we as a company or an organization want to get out of it how does that align with our mission um and asking other questions like, oh, I noticed that you're designating this new task to me and that it's not necessarily within my description. And so I'm wondering, like, is this a favor that you just that you want me to do? And if so, that's fine. Um, or like, is it something that you want me to do long term? And maybe in the future, like you'll consider compensating me based on this new project um, that I'm taking on. So it's important to have these conversations with your employers before you go into that headspace where you're just like straight up subversion. (laughs) Like you're going around like trying to like, um, like destroy the system. Um, But if it does get to that point, there are ways to disrupt the system and there are ways to get what you want and get what you need out of a predatory work environment where where your employer is not taking your needs, wants, goals, and aspirations into consideration when making their decisions, um, you know, when where they are not consulting with you um, before, you know, making decisions that affect you. Uh, so there were things that I would do, man. There were things that I would do. I'm not, oh, dress code? Uh-uh. If I want to show up in sweats, I'm going to show up in sweats. Because you're not paying me enough to be professional. You're not giving me what I need. So why am I going to give you what you need? Well, Manny, we're going to fire you. They never said that. But I'm saying if like, and you have to understand where you stand in proximity to your employer on that note, as far as the power dynamics are concerned, because a lot of workers are, 
had been brainwashed into believing that we don't have as much power as our employers and that we truly are dispensable, that we're replaceable. And that's a lie. That's a lie. But it's a lie that you can make a reality if you don't have confidence as a worker, if you don't feel empowered. And so I knew in the back of my head when I when I would commit certain transgressions in order to, I don't know, maintain sanity and stop myself from burning out. I knew that when I would skip certain tasks, I, I knew in the back of my head, like, they aren't going to fire me. They can't. Like, they literally, they can't afford to fire me. So I'm going to do what I do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and then always make sure that you make a couple friends within the organization so that if you need references, you might not be able to get it from your direct supervisor, but you can get it from somebody in a supervisor position. See what I'm saying? Um, cause you don't want to, you don't want to completely burn your bridge. There's a reason the great resignation as it is called is happening at the moment across the country. Yeah, agree, absolutely, absolutely. Because bosses don't know how to treat their employees, man. They don't know how to treat, they don't know how to treat their employees. Dignity, respect, flexibility. You know, don't, don't try to, and, and don't try to force friendship onto your employees either. Don't try to get in people's heads like that because a lot of bosses will do that. They'll, they'll bring up personal shit. They'll maybe try to talk to you. How are the kids doing? Huh? Oh, what are you doing this? For, what'd you do this weekend? Like, that's not necessary. Just because it's a, it's a mind game. It's like, if I do that and if I appeal to like uh, your, your emotions in your personal life, then maybe just maybe that'll make you work a little harder or that'll make you think twice before half-assing a project or coming to work late or asking for vacation time or, you know, negotiating for better benef benefits when your contract expires. It's like, no, that is like, that's manipulation, man. You don't, you might not think that you're doing anything malignant right now, but that's not right. It's not right. So don't do that. You know, you don't, we don't have to have the whole cocktail hour and then like everybody acts like they're best friends. And when in all reality, if we weren't working here, we wouldn't be interacting with each other on a personal level. And once one of us does move on from this job, chances are we're not going to be friends. So why fake the funk? Why? Can't we just acknowledge that we're here to get a job done? And that's not to say you can't create friendships or that, you know, you shouldn't create friendships in your place of work. It's just recognizing the reality of work, <laughs> which is production. I'm here to produce. You want me to produce, right? Um, so I'm going to produce and let's just reach, let's try to reach equitable terms with regards to my production that are squarely aligned with the mission of your company and aligned with my own personal mission, right? Because a lot of these jobs want you to conform. They want you to work in uniformity at all times and uh, not see yourself as an individual, but as a team member. It's like, last time I checked, y'all did not cut me a $50 million check to play three seasons of basketball. Like this ain't the N this ain't the NBA. This ain't the NFL. And I'm not a team member. <laughs> I'm a part of a team that is working to achieve, you know, certain goals. And hopefully those goals, those goals are clearly defined. But this ain't a fucking team. My wife called the cable company earlier because we're having a tech problem and they told her they were hiring. Whoa. 
that just goes to show <laughs> that a lot, a lot of these companies are down bad, which I chalk up in large part to the fact that they've never been truly pushed, you know, but this pandemic has kind of push them into a corner where not only are people quitting, but they're applying a lot less. Not only are they quitting and applying a lot less, but you know, the companies are also losing profits as a result. And you know, I just want people to understand that money talks. And once you start hitting people or companies in their pockets, that's when they respond. They don't, you know, so some of them, because you got to have faith, right? I, I don't want to just be a nihilist. There are decent people who work in administrative positions who will negotiate fairly with you, um, or at least try to the best of their ability to the extent that they have power. Um, but, you know, oftentimes it comes down to them needing to have their arm twisted into being fair, into being equitable. And that's just how it works. And that's why I always recommend, always recommend negotiating. You know, like with the school that accepted me, um, I know like we, we, we had to negotiate because they offered me something initially and I was like, know if I can I don't know if I can do that because I I want to be able to concentrate on my work I want to be able to give my all to my studies I want to be able to focus on research because this project is bigger than me therefore it means a lot to me but I can't do that if I'm constantly worrying about finances so I say that during our meeting and I let them know that look there's very little standing in the way of me accepting your offer it's not about what another program can offer in terms of finances, it's about the extent to which I can minimize distractions around me to get this work done. And not even a half hour later, I get an email, boom, big fellowship, congratulations. And I say, okay, boom, there you go. So communication does help. Communication does help, but that doesn't come without confidence. You got to be confident in the shit that you're doing and what you can bring to the table in order to negotiate. In order to negotiate, you know, for what you deserve, rather, because you can negotiate and not be confident. You might just end up negotiating for far less than you deserve. Same. All right. And I said I'll be around for 20 minutes, but I'll shoot for like seven. Try to end at, um, yeah, I'll shoot for like seven, eight more minutes. But I'm glad. Uh, are you doing well? You doing all right? Cough. Excuse me. Cough. Hiccup. Uncle G, it is awful, let me tell you. Surviving, I hear you. I hear you. Um, we're in the same boat, man. Is there any song that you can recommend since we've given you recommendations most of the time? Mm. Yeah, sure. Falsia Puppet, the, the song called Puppet by Falsia. I just listened to that the other day and that was pretty good. I was impressed. It's tough, man, because I don't, um, let me think. A Dua Lipa songs, a lot of Dua Lipa songs are just, oh. Um, am, I, am I on your mind? What's that called? What's that song called? Let me look it up. Oh, Blow Your Mind by Dua Lipa. 
You know, I've just been into upbeat music lately. Honestly, I've just been into upbeat songs. Mahalia, Letter to My Ex. I listened to that yesterday. She's a special talent. Yeah, there are a few, man. There are a few. Um, the Weekend Song. Yes, yeah, vintage Dua Lipa. So you know, you know about the difference. You know that she comes in in waves. Um, there was one song on Weekend's album that I really liked, man. Um, Take my breath. No, no, no. There, there, there were a couple. I mean, Vintage Weekend, you want to talk about like a lot of these artists, man, some of their earliest stuff is their best stuff. Let me see. Let me see. Is there someone else by the weekend? Yeah. Is there someone else by the weekend? Sigrid, people, people have, yeah, I've heard that name before. I've heard that name before. Sigrid or Sigrid. You know what I've been listening to a lot lately is like old school, like dance hall, Jamaican music. Um, like Egyptian. He has a great Tiny Desk concert you should check out. Wayne Wonder, Camila Cabello, absolutely. Um, Control, I think, is her song. Don't Go Yet. She puts out some great music. I'm gonna talk about like melodic artists. Uh, Party Next Door. You know, I know I, I said his name at nauseum. Lockdown by Coffee. Yeah, I still got a list of Jamaican artists that I got to check out. Because when I went on my trip, I asked the people at the resort, the people that worked there, I was like, you know, I like dance hall music, but I feel like a lot of the music I listen to is like West, not Westernized dance hall, but um, North American bass, I guess. Uh, but I want to hear that real shit. And they gave me a whole list of people to check out. Where's my phone? I might have to charge this thing too. Yep, I got to charge it. The phone's not working right now, but I'll charge it. How are y'all doing though? Y'all doing all right? Um, yeah, there's so many talented artists out there, man. And I keep saying it, but I really want to, um, I, I want to check out like those, like artists from the seventies and eighties and nineties. One, because I'm just not familiar with a lot of music back then. And if I am, it's like more so in like the soul direction, like just, um, Michael Jackson and stuff like that. But I want to, I want to check that out. And I feel like that has like a subscriber. What do you think about that cough hiccup? I feel like we've talked about this before, but 
you know who um, who gets a lot of views off of that is this woman named Royce Rogue. Um, so if y'all want to check her out, she she does a lot of reactions to um, uh, Jim Morrison and, and the Beatles and all, all kinds of music. So I feel like there might be something there. Um, Royce Rogue. Yeah. Here, I'll share her thing. I'll share her her channel. Because I, I don't think one can fully be a music connoisseur unless they understand the history on which um, a lot of the music they listen to now was built. Heavily copyright claims. Yeah, that makes sense. You know what I do to balance out those copyright claims, though, is I go to, I try to look them up and then I'll put like cover, like where they're doing a cover of someone else's song or an acapella version. Um, that helps me. Like if you see, I don't just react to, um, Olivia Rodrigo songs, like I have a bunch of covers that I've reacted to where she's just sitting in a room like playing the guitar. And I love hearing talented artists cover other talented artists' music. So that works. And then of course, you don't get the copyright claim more often than not. First segment. Oh yeah, see when they come with the blocks, that's a different story. Because the blocks are just annoying and they take a lot of time to manage and put filters over. It's too much. Too much. Like Yeba. I enjoy Yeba's music. But for some reason, I it's probably the software that I'm using. Um, I, they just don't let me publish it. And so I'll spend 20 minutes reacting to Yeba's song and get a copyright block. And then I go back, try to place a filter over it. Oh man, it's still blocked. Got to make it blurrier. Still blocked. Got to. So she's one artist that I'm like, all right, unfortunately I just can't react to her music anymore. Um, and if these artists want the shine, if they want to see um, reactors check out their content and give honest and thorough feedback, then they're going to have to start talking to the publishing companies because I'm, I'm just not going to do that. Live performances, artists. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's true. They're not always the best quality. Wow, but it's been four months since she's uploaded um, any new reactions. That is interesting. She was on a tear, though, for a long time. She was just growing and growing and growing and growing. But I, I get it, though, because sometimes um, this shit will burn you out if you're not careful. So at this point, I'm just trying to create a routine for myself that will give me like the motivation um, and passion to just put out more videos, um, put out videos more frequently. But I think once I start the doctoral program going into this fall, um, I'll be much more selective with the content that I'm uploading and uh, only react to like a few kinds of content. One is if it generates, you know, a lot of views, sure. And, but I got to enjoy it. So it's all, it's all prefaced under like the banner of me enjoying it. I mean, if I don't enjoy it, then I'm not going to react, but enjoy it. But it has to come with the views to the views, subscribers. And then if I enjoy it, you know, that's that's great. Um, or of course, special requests that people make. Cause it just and, and it blows my mind how like a lot of smaller artists who have not yet blown up, blown up, like they put copyright claims on their videos. I'm like, how do you expect it to ever get out there, man? How do you expect 
a reactor with more than a thousand subscribers to check your shit out if you're just going to put a copyright block on it. Because at that point, there's little benefit that I get from sharing your content um, or platforming it on my channel. Love your Camila reactions. Thank you so much, Selena. Yeah. You know what? I keep, I'm a boundary. Talk about boundaries. I'm a boundary breaker myself because I told myself that I'll be done by a certain time, but let's just clean. We'll cut it clean. Um, we'll, you know, we'll cut, cut off the live at um, two hours. So in 10 minutes. You know what would be dope if y'all could get me to like 20 likes before I cut off the stream. But yeah. And I think another thing that I want to work on as far as uploading content is concerned is like the timing, right? Um, like reacting to things like the, the hour or the minute they come out. Cause that's when you get a lot of the, a lot of the traffic. But it's just so, sometimes with the motivation, you know? Oh, wow. Olivia Rodrigo performed Deja Vu the other day. That's something I got to add to my list then. I didn't know. I didn't know they did that. Tate McRae. I heard one of her songs the other day. I was impressed. And it's nice to see that Avril Lavigne is still um, doing her thing. Do you have any postmodern jukebox stuff? Mm. What is that? Postmodern jukebox. Oh, no reactions to them? No. I'll subscribe to them and keep an eye out for the next video they drop. And that would be nice too, to just like diversify my base even, even more than it all. Oh, wow, they just dropped something three days ago. Even, oh, they did a cover? No, but I wanna, um, yeah, I wanna do that. Oh, wow. So are they a cover band? Because this looks interesting. Oh, they did a, a 1920s uh, Dua Lipa cover. New covers, old school swing styles. That's dope. Yeah, I have to check them out. List. I need to. I mean, I had a list. Or do I? Because there are some folks that I want to check out. Because um, Encanto, I think they have a couple other songs that folks asked me to check out. You know, I was saying this in my Camila reaction, but I'm surprised they didn't reach out to her to take part in that movie. Or maybe they did. But you know, I really, um, I don't like Lim Manuel Miranda, and I think that guy is a fucking. I think he's a grifter. I don't like him, and I don't like that everybody likes him. Like, I guess I, I don't care. I don't care. But like, when I think, when the thought crosses my mind, you know, I just don't like that. Like, I don't think about it a lot, but when I do, I just don't like that.
And is it just me or do I feel like a lot of these rappers that put music out? Um, something tells me that their views are bought. A lot of these rappers, because I've I've reacted to a couple rappers uh, on a few occasions, but Harry Mack, except Harry Mack, because yeah, his, his audience is real, but for some reason they just don't gain traction. They don't gain traction. Like that whole Drake album I reacted to. I think it's sitting at like 300 views. And I reacted to it the morning after it came out. But yeah, I'm I'm hopeful about the trajectory that I'm on right now though. Nothing too crazy, but um, you know, I'm still building. Still building. How have your reaction videos been going, Cough? I bumped into him in NYC. Wow, did you? Almost knocked him over. No idea who he was, but his wife was all excited. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, but your wife was all excited. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Oh, you're doing pretty good. You've been uploading regularly. But what's going on with these thumbnails, though? Like, not to judge. And maybe, you know, I don't know if um, you need or want advice because your channel is larger than mine, but um, have you ever used Canva? It's really quick and easy. Um, yeah, it's a really quick and easy platform to use and your thumbnails will be fired if you use them. Like I see in some of your videos, the words are over, like the letters are in front of your face. But in Canva, you can get them to like, like go behind you. Or you can place them in corners. Here. I'll send you a, a link to the website. And if um, if you know anyone in education, like who's currently in education, you can use their email to get a discount um, on the subscription. Like it's free for educators. So if you could get someone's email, or I don't even think, because I use my own personal email, but there's some kind of like petition you could submit and you know yeah otherwise i think it's like 60 bucks if you want it permanently and also i have a question for you is it difficult for you to keep up with patreon I feel like for me, it's really difficult to keep up with Patreon and like special requests and stuff. One, because like, I'm just scared. I, I don't like how it looks when, when the views are super low. And two, I'm scared it'll hurt me in the algorithm because for those of you who know about the algorithm, um, it can be unforgiving if you know you put out a video that doesn't get a lot of views. Um, you know, it might hurt your future view count. 
Oh, you do? Okay. Cool, cool. All right, well, have an account. Don't use any other social media other than YouTube. All right, I feel you. All right, y'all. So I think I'm going to go ahead and log off and finish my damn taxes. All right, but it's been fun. Y'all take care. I don't know when I'll do another stream, but when I do, I will try my best to announce it. All right, peace.